Set in 19th century England on the eve of the Industrial Revolution, 1985's The Mark of the Rani sees Colin Baker's Sixth Doctor and Nicola Bryant's Perry return to Earth to seek out the source of a mysterious time distortion. To facilitate this, the Doctor built himself a tracer device, and that prop is the subject of today's video, how I, in 2006, built an all-original parts, screen-accurate replica that you, if you follow my lead, can make as well. Stick around and I'll show you how I put mine together. The Sixth Doctor's tracer device is a prop so simple to replicate that it should take you no longer than a day to complete. To prove how easy it is, just have a look at this graphic that I've lovingly prepared for you as a visual guide. It clearly lists all the parts that are required to replicate this prop and shows how they are assembled, so it may be a good idea to pause the video now and familiarise yourself with it all, if of course you're willing to have a bash at making one yourself, that is. Also, please do feel free to screen grab this image if you need to. Calling this project a build is somewhat of an overstatement as you can plainly see, because for the most part all you're doing is plonking various plastic parts onto the shell of a vintage toy from the 1970s, and then slapping a load of paint over it. It really is that straightforward, and it almost seems insulting that I'm about to tell you how I made mine, because looking at this graphic it really is quite obvious as to how it was done. The best thing about this project is that you don't have to worry about needing specialised equipment to make it. In fact, all you need are a few basic items that I'm sure you probably already own. Such as... A pencil. A ruler. And a pair of compasses for mapping out your cuts. A screwdriver for disassembling the toy. For modifying the shell and making the details, you're going to need a sharp modeler's knife. A saw. Various flat files. And some sandpaper. If you happen to have a rotary tool, then that would make your life so much easier when it comes to hogging out the material from the base shell, though at a pinch this could also be done with a drill and a hacksaw blade. You can also use your drill in conjunction with a countersinking bit for the placement of the machine screws when it comes to mounting the on-off slider switch that sits on the side of the prop. Of course you'll also need some adhesive with which to stick all the details on. In that regard, I'd highly recommend solvent cement for the faceplate fabrication, and CA gel glue for the plant-on parts. Finally, for the finishing touches, you'll need some masking tape, grey primer, matte black, matte white, and gloss silver automotive spray, plus some acrylic paints for the weathering. With your tools and supplies ready, like me, you should be raring to go, so let's dive straight in. Starting with the walkie-talkie, I first popped out all the screws, cracked open the two shell halves, and eviscerated the contents, removing the main board and the speaker unit, as well as both of the orange plastic detail elements. Because I only needed the two shell components, the unwanted innards could be set aside in case I ever needed them again for some other project, but so far to date this just hasn't happened. Just a quick note here, if time and age hasn't already done it for you, now would be a good point as any to remove the Morse code sticker from the centre section, as you won't be needing that either. Obviously label remover works fantastically for this, though a quick squirt of WD-40 will do the job just as well, if you happen to have some to hand that is. Anyway, having done all that and given the show a quick wash to remove more than 30 years worth of dust and filth build up, I then began my modifications, starting by hogging out the speaker grill. Now you don't have to do this, but if you intend to fit the prop with a flashing lamp or an LED, then it is rather necessary. Mine doesn't light up yet, as primarily it's just a display piece that sits on a shelf doing absolutely nothing other than looking vaguely pretty, but I do have the option to come back in and add that feature should I ever feel the need to. Not that I'll ever be out in a Sixth Doctor costume cosplaying with it, that's for sure. I can attest with all certainty that it'll be a cold day in hell before I even remotely consider doing that again. I've already worn the original costume once, and that was more than enough for me, thank you very much. For the section where the lens covers will eventually sit, just like the speaker grill, I hogged that area out as the full lens assembly has to be inserted through this slot and glued on from the inside. The final modification was to cut out a space for the 28mm slider switch, then drill and countersink the screw holes for mounting it. A quick word of advice here though. When you come to do this, make sure that you allow enough room for the throw of the actual toggle switch, because otherwise you'll run into a world of pain and suffering later on if it's not wide enough. This is perhaps the only time that you'll ever have to be precise with your measurements for this prop, so make it count. 
With the show modification completed and set aside, I could now look at all the detail work, starting with the top nubbin. For that I used a cut down segment of 19mm ABS tubing for the main stem, and an unpainted flat end cap of the same diameter to close the tube off. Both of these pieces can be obtained from EMA model supplies if you're in the UK, or Plastruct if you hail from any of the other territories from around the world. In fact, all the fabrication parts and materials for this prop can be sourced from either of these two suppliers, which is rather handy. Just like the BBC prop, Look. the end cap doesn't need to be glued or even painted, and can be left off until the final assembly, though the tube itself should be fixed into place now so that it can be painted later on as one piece with the two shell halves. Moving down, a 58mm diameter tube that I found in my spares bin formed the basis of the shroud. I trimmed this down to the correct height and made a second angled cut to form the rather noticeable slope at the front. Having quickly completed that, I set it aside and turned my attention to the faceplate. Using an offcut of 1.5mm styrene sheet, I cut out a circular plate to match the exact inner diameter of the shroud. Then I drew up and cut out the arrow-shaped aperture that resides in the top half of the disc. Next, strips of 2mm fine line styrene angle were cut up and applied with solvent cement to form the detailing just as you see here. I also cut up some green translucent plastic to fit the aperture snugly, and because of the tight fit it stayed put by friction alone, needing no solvent weld to keep it in place at all. The final plant on detail at this stage in the proceedings lives right down at the bottom of the prop. It's a single 12mm diameter dome that sits smack bang in the centre of those concentric rings that I noted earlier in the general assembly graphic. Once I cemented that into position, it was now time to start thinking about the painting pass. The first task was to prime all the parts, including those five loose EMA column wedges and the shroud elements, but not the green arrow segment or that 19mm end cap. Once that was done, I simply top-coated everything with a base of matte black automotive spray, then allowed that to fully cure before proceeding to the next step. For the middle section where the nail black column wedges will ultimately go, I needed to mask the area off so that I could spray the contrast colour on with several coats of silver. This was done in two or three passes until I had a full and even coverage of colour. As soon as that was cured, I removed the masking tape and carefully adhered the wedges in situ with the merest hint of gel glue, being cautious to avoid any squeeze out. The final step was of course to mask off the shroud section and paint on the fine white trim accents that surround it. Once that was done I could start assembling it all and race towards the finish line. I began by setting the shroud cover and the faceplate carefully into position with gel glue, making sure that the orientation was true and square to the prop. Next the slider switch was mounted with care, so as not to scratch the paintwork with my screwdriver during this operation. The last thing that I wanted now was to cock it up at this late stage in the game as that would have been totally and utterly devastating if it happened. Back at the top of the prop, the unpainted end cap was simply friction fitted into the nubbin, requiring no glue here at all, so that was quick and painless. Lastly, the green and red panel indicator lenses were snapped over their diffusers and seated into the cutout slot that I made earlier in the upper shell. These were then fixed into place from the inside with gel glue. If you're going to add any electronics to your replica, now would obviously be the ideal time to install them, before you screw the shell halves back together. It was at this last phase where I deviated ever so slightly from my plan. The original prop has some very pale weathering applied all over it, but to my eye this looks ridiculous in stark contrast to the dark colour of the shell. It just doesn't look that realistic. However, being a stickler for detail, I did start to replicate it authentically, but as I did so I absolutely loathed it, so I went back and removed it all. Instead I opted for a more subtle approach of dark specular splattering, which I felt seemed a little better suited to the prop given the fact that in the story the Doctor had only just built it, so realistically it wouldn't have had much in the way of weathering at this point anyway. It's a small deviation but one that I'm happy with, however if you like the original weathering then go for it, it's your replica, so you do whatever makes you happy. And that was that, the project was completed. If you followed along you should now have a screen accurate replica built from all original pieces sitting in your collection, and what could be better than that eh, other than owning one of the two originals of course, but at least you've got yours at a fraction of the price. Well, I'll tell you exactly what can be better than that, owning a screen accurate replica built from all original parts of two props. Yes, because not only was this used as the Doctor's time distortion detector in The Mark of the Rani, but it also appeared as Commander Lytton's Cyberman tracker in this season's opener, Attack of the Cybermen. So you see, two props for the price of one. 
I can tell you're impressed. Now, 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 gentlemen, gentlemen, please. I'm, I'm sure we can come to some amicable understanding. Come on, please, please. Now you've gone too far. After all the effort that went into making that. And that just about wraps things up here. If you like what you've seen, please feel free to like, comment and share this video. Also, don't forget to hit that notification bell if you're a subscriber. And if you're not a subscriber and I can't see any reason why it wouldn't be, then why not become one? It's very easy, plus it helps the channel out. Speaking of helping the channel out, I've just launched my very own Patreon page. If you like what I do here and want to pitch in by tossing me a few quid to help keep the lights on, then that would be great and I'd appreciate it immeasurably. But don't feel pressured into anything, it's not like my life depends on it. No, not that much. Well, that's it for now. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you again next time.